I'm Niall Kaufman, president of the board of the Iowa Mennonite Historical Society of Kelowna, Iowa. Our mission is to preserve and present the history of Mennonites in Iowa. To that end, we have a meeting every spring and fall where we present a subject or speakers that relate to the history of Iowa. <clears throat> Due to the COVID problem of uh, this past year, our meetings have been disrupted. So we've decided to present a virtual meeting. To that end, I went to Elkhart, Indiana and interviewed John Vanderwerf and his sister, Isabel Vanderwerf Miller, who were born in Holland and lived there during the occupation uh, by the Germans of, of, of the country during World War II. Um, and their story relates to the Mennonites in Holland and then to the Mennonites in Iowa. So you'll hear that story presented today. <clears throat> Holland was uh, managed to stay neutral during World War I and didn't get involved in the war. And their goal during World War II was the same, to be neutral. John Vanderwerf was born in 1932 in, in Friesland province of Holland. And um, the Germans invaded Holland on May the 5th, 1942. Uh, Hitler thought that he could uh, invade Germany and accomplish the invasion for in, in about two hours or certainly by two days. Well, it took him five days. They bombed The Hague, the Rotterdam, uh, brought in paratroopers and uh, <clears throat> fought. The Dutch realized that they didn't have the resources for a prolonged war. And so after 10 days, they surrendered to the Germans. Queen Wilhelmina fled the country and um, the German invasion was on. So John Vanderwerf was an eight year old boy when the Germans invaded. Uh, he talks about the initial time as being kind of a, an interesting time uh before I got the camera rolling, he told the story of how when the Germans first came to town, he and his friends would ride their bicycles around and, and look at them. And they had a, uh, a an old school, I believe, that they uh, camped at about a half a mile from his house. And <clears throat> he would ride over there and watch what they did. But after some months of the occupation, things got harder and the Germans took his bicycle so he couldn't ride around and look at him anymore. <clears throat> uh, by February of 1941, the Germans were working harder at deporting Jews. And in, particularly in February of 41, a, a group of them were deported and created a significant <clears throat> resistance among the Dutch people and they created a strike. Life got harder for everyone from that time on. In a year later, in May of 1942, the Germans required all the Jews to wear the Star of David and life became even harder. <clears throat> and by the war lasted until May the 5th of 1945 when Germany finally surrendered. We have a map here of <clears throat> the Netherlands. Friesland is this province in the north near this town of Harrigan is a, a little town, Jawar, and that's where the Vanderwer family lived. This is the Amsterdam area where the capital was and the initial attack was at The Hague and at Rotterdam. <clears throat> Now, the Dutch people responded in various ways to the war. 
There were some that were called collaborators, which helped with the Germans and gave them information and <clears throat> were very friendly to them. Some people were indifferent and tried to mind their own business, and some people became resistors. And they resisted in various ways. The Germans wanted the Dutch young people to join their army. So one of the things was to help the Dutch young people run away or hide. The Germans got after the Jews. And by the end of the war, 70% of the Jews who were in Holland at the beginning of the war were killed. This was the highest rate of extermination of any country. <clears throat> um, there are famous stories of resistance during that time. And two of those that are well known to us are the story of Corey Ten Boom, uh, who lived in the Amsterdam area and in, in this Harlan. And <clears throat> her family were watchmakers and they became involved in the resistance in a very big way hiding young people, hiding Jews, uh, getting forged ration cars, provide food for them. They were ended up uh, being captured by the Germans and Corey and her sister were put in a concentration camp. Corey survived, her sister didn't. She wrote the book, The Hiding Place, which details her experiences and is very interesting. The Anne Frank diary comes from this time period as well. Otto Frank was living in Germany in the 1930s. He sensed the resistance to the Jews and moved to Holland and was a merchant in Amsterdam. During the German occupation, the family went into hiding and the diary of Anne Frank is the story of that hiding. They hid from July 1942 to August 1944 when they were found and <clears throat> all the family died in the concentration camp except Otto. He survived and he managed to uh, get this story presented to the world, which we know. <clears throat> so we're going to present to you John and... Vanderwerf and his sister Izzy Vanderwerf Miller as they tell stories about uh, their life in Holland. So here we go. So I am with John Vanderwerf and his sister Izzy. John, why don't you tell us where you were born and when and your circumstances? Well, I was born in 32, and we lived in Yauda in Friesland, and uh, in 1940 we were invaded by the Germans uh, peacefully, and uh, we kind of assumed that they were there as friendly but then later on we found out they were not, they were our enemies. And after that we learned that they were kind of taking over everything and giving us all new rules and the mayor had a, you know, step down and they had a, a German person in charge giving us orders what to do and so forth or what not to do or where not to go or and then they start putting curfews on and they start taking things away from us and they just make life harder as it went from year to year and then we had to uh, give up our radios and most of them had to give up a bicycle for this and that and then the food became scarce and and then finally, in maybe in around 42, 43, um, things got a little bit tough and we had to uh, cover our windows up always at night. We couldn't have no lights seen anywhere because planes were going over to Germany at night and they didn't want them to know where we were. And 
the German fighter planes were always around. And at night, <clears throat> right after dark, uh, there would be planes coming over to check every city and town. They'd fly over to see if any light was coming. And uh, I remember one time we had uh, them coming over. We, you know, we could hear them every night coming. And all of a sudden they were shooting. And we figured, well, they must have seen some light somewhere. And they try to take care of it. And it was, I think, what they were aiming at it was that, the, uh, not a nursing home, but the uh, place where the Germans were staying uh, in that building because uh -huh. that was hit mostly because we found out and uh, our aunt and uncle, but she was staying part of the time. They lived just across the railroad track from us and they got all a bunch of roof tile broke from some of the shots and they had bullets in their window frames and stuff like that. All those houses through there. That was quite a scare. Uh, but it was just a warning to make sure that you had everything blacked out, you know, that they couldn't see. So, so they did that sometimes. So, so tell us, when the Germans first came, how did you, how did you view them in your well, town? They, at, at very first, when they moved in, they were like friends to us because we didn't know any different because I was, well, I was about eight years old and uh, my friends were with me and, you know, we thought that it was kind of neat to see them coming in, but not realizing they were our enemy. So we just went along with them and it was fine maybe for a few months, but then start realizing that they were not our friends and then, the, <laughs> then they start doing all these things that turned things around and made it like we were supposed to be part of Germany, but of course it never happened. But anyway, they stuck around for five years and as the year went by, it just got worse and worse and worse and then food was scarce, except we were fortunate very fortunate to live in Friesland because we had gardens, we had dairy, you know, the Friesian uh, dairy was uh, one of the biggest dairy lands, making cheese and butter and so forth. So we were lucky. We, we could always get stuff from a farm. My dad was friend with many farms and um, I after school I'd go you know out to the farm and I'd go and get milk and we'd make our own butter, you know, and skim it off and then we'd make our own butter. So we were fortunate that we had food and we could have a garden and Dad was quite a gardener, so we always had enough laid up for the winter time, you know, carrots and bucks of sand and so forth. You know, we preserved and canned. So we were. Food-wise, we were oh, pretty much okay. It wasn't, sugar was hard to get, soap was not to be had, and you know, a lot of things you could not get anymore towards the end. And, uh, <clears throat> well, I'll put this in between. Um, since things were so bad in the big cities, um, the Mennonite Church at that time uh, put out a, a call for people to come and take children in from the city. So folks signed up for that and we had a girl from Amsterdam stay with us uh, for a couple of years I think she was with us and she was you know skinny and all get out. Because uh, they lived on tulip bulbs and stuff like that. That's all they could eat. So the parents couldn't feed them so they send them out to the country and they wind up in Friesland. And yeah, we were lucky to have one that we could take care of. Anyway, um, <clears throat> in the meantime, while this was going on, Dad worked for the underground. 
uh, you know what that is all about. Tell us. She, uh, uh, yeah, the underground is uh, where they move Jews mostly and American flyers from one point to a next point and it was mostly Jews and dad was quite involved in that by uh, helping Jews get out of the country. I don't know how they, where they went or how they went. That I didn't know because that was pretty secretive mm -hmm. business. But I do know that we had them at home. Dad would bring them home and we had a place <clears throat> in our kitchen uh, where we had the linoleum on the floor and you could pull it up and there was a, a like a trap door to, to go to underneath the crawl space and that was a place where dad hid some of them if they got a little bit hot and he would make sure that they would have a place so they wouldn't get caught and then that must have been on you know for quite a few years that he was doing this he would go out at night and I I was not aware of it it's a good thing I didn't I, it wouldn't have been you know, safe kids will talk mm -hmm. so dad did his stuff at night and then uh, one night um, I don't know it was in 43 I think all of a sudden uh, we were sleeping up yeah because she was from after that, which is at that time too, we were sleeping upstairs and uh, my window from my bedroom was over towards where the street was and all of a sudden all the lights came on and it was just like in daylight, you know, in our bedroom and I thought, what's going on, you know, and, and the next thing I knew there were soldiers uh, by our front door and they were wanted to come in and so dad let them in and I remember that and do you I, no, I just no. remember the fear of it and they came and ransacked our house they got us out of bed you know they with their guns they just you know get out you know in German and so we had to get out of bed and they just searched all over the house because they were sure that were Jews or flyers at our house Somebody tipped them off, and we a little bit that later on talk about. He think who it was that might have said something, um, but they went through everything and they could not find anything. Then they went across the street where she was, sometimes at my aunt's place, across the street. They went over there because they had a, a boy that was supposed to go into. Germany that you know the young people were called up to go there and they had two boys in the house that were of age to go so they went over there and they searched their place and those boys were already gone to a farm hiding out somewhere a couple of kilometers south of us on a farm later on I found out where they were because I ran into them but anyway yeah, the young people and you know, and people of age that were supposed to go to Germany, they would have to go get on the train and they haul them away. And my dad's brother, uh, Omari, uh, he went. He's well, he had to go. They had no choice, but he went, and he went to Germany and said they had a job for him over there and put him to work and so forth. Well, he worked in a in a factor but they made the V1 rockets at that time. Mm -hmm. He worked in that factory for six months or so and then they gave him furlough to go home and to come back. Well then when he came back, but he never went back again, so he went under too on a farm someplace. But that's what they were doing. So anyway. So that night they made a raid on your house. Did you actually have a stranger there? Did I watch what? Did your father have a have a stranger there that he was keeping that night? No, no, no. I'll tell you more about that. My dad was uh, a real good friend of our our, uh, our dentist, oh, Doctor Ozinga, and I went to school with the boys. Went to the Christian school with me, 
and I was at their house quite often, but we knew him quite well, and Dad was kind of friends with him. But he was, a, a, what do you call it? A collaborator. A collaborator with the Germans. He was feeding the Germans, what, what, you know, he liked the Germans or whatever. Anyway, he was friends with them and hung around with the German uh, Gestapo and so forth. Well, Dad thought that was a, a good thing for him to know him, to find out all the stuff that what they knew, and Dad would take that. And, and that's how Dad found out about that they were going to be doing a raid. And that's how he had disposed of anybody or anything that had to do with them, because he had the inside information. Oh, okay. And he was always collaborating with him. <clears throat> And the doctor never found out what dad did or what he really go well dad would have been shot yeah. right there if they'd have found out he was you know yeah. trying to find out from the doctor so that went on all through the war and neither one of them ever knew what they were doing that they were leaking out stuff that because the doctor would have never spoke up a lot of things dad probably asked questions and you know he answered probably and, and he had no idea what was going on, and but Dad, Dad knew what was going on. He had to know to save his life, you know, because otherwise the Germans would have gotten him right away. Yeah. But anyway, that was kind of a, a kind of a dangerous, tricky maneuvering those years, I guess you might say. So anyway, that's what Dad was into, and that's. Uh, part of that horrible time. So did you see some of the people that he would help that you'd see him come to your house anytime? No. He couldn't. No. He couldn't allow that because, like he said, kids would talk. He oh, had okay. to do it without us knowing. So if he, if he brought somebody to your house, he made sure you guys were gone? No, I was upstairs. You know, oh, okay. we were sleeping upstairs. Us kids were upstairs and... <clears throat> We did, never knew <clears throat> what happened downstairs. Sometimes I was wondering what the noise was about downstairs, but you wouldn't dare to go down because you're not supposed to go down. So whatever happened, and it, it just never dawned on me that's what it was. It just never, never come to my mind that it would be Jews or whoever came into our house, I it just never occurred to me. <coughs> so anyway, so um, that's how Dad was quite familiar with the farmers in the whole neighborhood because that's where they hide all these young people. They came from all over from. All over Holland, they come to Friesland to hide out on farms. <clears throat> uh, a very good friend of ours that lived uh, just a little bit east of us uh, had a big dairy farm. And I remember spending time there because Dad would go there and visit over there while it was Dad's friends. And I'd be there in the summertime, I'd help with him making hay and we were up on the farm, we're running around all over, and there were probably eight or ten young people in that farm hiding in there. Even though we were playing around there, I never got to see any of them. But somehow uh, it was leaked out. I'm getting ahead of my story a little bit. <clears throat> that was going on on that farm. Um, in the back of that farm, out in the hay field, way in the back, ammunition was dropped at night from planes. Um, they had <coughs> staked out, and they, I found out a lot of this after the war. They'd stake out lights and corners that would shine up and they, they would come from England and they'd fly over and find out where the drop area was. And in the back of this farm, 
out in the field they would parachute down ammunition uh, and guns and so forth and they would have the underground people be out there make sure that there were no Germans around anywhere because they you know they could come out in the middle of the night and they would collect all this stuff bring it to the farm and they would put them in the uh, manure pits over in Holland they have concrete manure pits the liquid manure oh, okay okay and they would petition it off on the ground where the liquid manure was and it was dry on the other and they stored all that stuff in there during the war collecting that that put it in there and nobody ever found out that that's where they were putting it and they had it ready whenever the troops would be coming someday that they could get it out and use it and yeah that was quite an operation that how they how they did that without being detected I don't know but anyway that farm the uh, Brower was his name uh, he was picked up from a farm and they took him in of suspicion and they took him into he had a friend where the hospital was where she was at and they put them all in the prison over there and somewhere along the line some underground people uh, blew something up that would belong to the Germans or had uh, something happen at night with one of their vehicles flipped over or something and a, a German would get killed or so you know the underground was always working on something to dis interrupt the German troops well they took I think I was four people out of prison and shot them because they were interfering with the Germans but this farmer was one of them so he was killed even though he was not directly pointed out to be connected with what was going on on his farm but you know they just pick them at random and Try he to happened scare, to be one of them. Yeah. Scare and, the people. Yeah. But that happened all along throughout, you know, it was kind of a not a daily thing, but they would something that happened quite often and that oh, then you found out that a German car got blown up somewhere along the road and but then they knew the underground did it because there were some high officials in those vehicles or there was a reason for doing that that they did that you know but the underground was always on top of that stuff and a lot of people got killed over that yeah so that was part of life as it was and then they start taking all the church bell towers the the, the bells out out of the churches you know because they needed the metal for making ammunition and stuff so they stripped all that stuff out every town got cleaned out that way and 